Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Gerhard Kasper, and I'm the president of the American Academy. And one of the interesting aspects of doing this uh, week after week, and sometimes several times a week, is that the crowds, if you consider yourself a crowd, uh, uh, that the crowds change in character. And I was about to say tonight seems to me to be a very philosophical crowd, except then they were so unruly over there uh, that I, I'm not sure that was a, 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 an appropriate characterization. My main task, I have two tasks uh, whenever I get up here. Well, no, sometimes I have more than that. But tonight I, I have two tasks. One is to welcome you, and I welcome you warmly. I ho I'm absolutely certain this will be a very fascinating and interesting evening. My second task is to introduce Professor Schmidt, who will introduce, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the introducer of the introducer, and uh, uh, he gets five to eight minutes or six to eight minutes to introduce Philip, and I get two minutes or less than that to introduce Thomas. Professor Schmidt is a professor of ethics at uh, the Humboldt University. Now, ethics is, of course, for all of us who have dealt with it over the years, a rather elusive concept, if I may say so. But the Germans have found an incredible answer to that. His chair is a chair in praktische Philosophie, Practical philosophy. Now, we know that we can turn to Professor Schmidt for everything no other philosopher answers, uh, uh, gives us answers to. And uh, this is a delight to have him introduce uh, Philip. He studied at uh, Göttingen and Oxford, and his Göttingen dissertation was about the idea of a social contract. Now, you understand that to a constitutional historian and constitutional lawyer as I am, uh, the, I appreciate that Professor Schmidt understood what is important in life. The, without a social contract, without the social contract, we would have no constitutional law, we would have no constitutional history, I would never have had a job. And uh, uh, so I appreciate that Schmidt understands what in life is important, and he understood it as early as his dissertation. That is a pretty good record you have. And then he went on uh, to do his habilitation, also in Göttingen, on objectivity and moral philosophy. I looked at your bibliography. Uh, actually, I tried to read. I, I'm a kind of conscientious person, and I wanted to read some of your articles uh, uh, and they are usefully linked uh, uh, to the web, and so you can, uh, except my computer didn't work. I have the oldest computer presently because my real computer was stolen two weeks ago. So not here, but uh, uh, in the Grunewald. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I am restricted to a, a very old computer that uh, doesn't, did not want to link to anything on the net and produce a text for me. Uh, among, uh, so restricted to Professor Schmidt's bibliography, I saw that among uh, the work he has done in recent years is work on moral relativism. And of course, it, you understand immediately the connection to practical philosophy, because very few topics are actually more relevant to our present day politics to Germany's task to come to grips uh, with uh, immigration that often represents extremely different values. And uh, therefore, I, I think what you're doing seems really to be practical philosophy, Professor Schmidt. Thank you very much, Professor Kasper, for this introduction of the introducer. There is a narrative that uh, describes Western philosophy as having started as a field comprising almost all of humankind's intellectual endeavors, but which has over the centuries lost much of its topics to what we now know as the sciences. In particular, among those fascinated by the sciences and 
fascinated in particular by their immense progress, there is a tendency to question whether the residual area that does, according to the narrative, remain for philosophy contain anything of interest at all. Against this sort of skepticism, traditionally oriented philosophers have been eager to defend the view that there is a set of important philosophical problems that will remain at the heart of what philosophy should be concerned about. Now, Philip Kitcher, whom to introduce as our tonight's speaker, it is my honor and pleasure, is among those who are fascinated by the sciences. Moreover, he is among those who are convinced that scientific progress has considerable transformative effects on how we should conceive of the respectability of different sorts of our intellectual projects, including philosophy. Equally, he is convinced that despite the triumphs of the sciences, philosophy needs to play a distinct and important role in the concerto of different attempts to come to terms with our place in the world and to actively shape our future. However, Philip Getter strongly opposes the idea that philosophical problems and methodology can and need to be safeguarded against being taken over by the sciences in order to remain in the splendid intellectual isolation of the a priori. Doing so, as he sees it, would lead to philosophy being a sentimental indulgence of the few. Here, as in many other contexts, Kitcher takes up motives from the American pragmatist John Dewey. Rather, philosophy is, according to Kitcher, able to provide a framework that allows it to team up with the sciences, with literature, with music, and with other distinctively human projects in our attempts to address those problems that we face here and now and that we want to get tackled and ultimately solved. Providing such a framework and working with it is the project that philosophy, as Kitcher sees it, ought to embark on. And it is the project that he has embarked on under the title Renewing Pragmatism here at the Academy. Now, the beginning of Kitcher's fascination for the sciences dates back long before he took up his current position as John Dewey Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. He started his career as a philosopher of mathematics, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, of mathematics and of science. Amongst other of his work, his books, The Nature of Mathematical Knowledge, 1983, and The Advancement of Science, Oxford University Press, 1993, uh, 1993 document results of his rigorous and original work in these areas. Over the years, he focused more and more on the philosophy of biology, and in particular, on the philosophy of evolution. Important papers on these areas have been republished under the title In Mendel's Mirror, Philosophical Reflections on Biology, in 2003, also by OUP. Already rather early in his career, however, Kitcher has also been concerned with the transformative effects that the sciences have on other areas of our thinking, as, for instance, documented in his discussion of creationism, abusing science, the case against creationism, 1982, and in his critique of sociobiology, vaulting ambition, sociobiology, and the quest for human nature, 1985. And in particular, in his view, in view of his work on the philosophy of evolution, the question as to how we should conceive of a religious outlook in a secular age has been a recurrent theme in his writings, Living After Darwin, Living with Darwin, Evolution Design and the Future of Faith, 2007, Life After Faith, The Case for Secular Humanism, 2014. Since the late 1990s, ethical topics have become more and more important in Kitcher's work. Whereas in The Lives to Come, The Genetic Revolution and Human Possibilities, 1996, he dealt with what sometimes are called first order moral problems. His The Ethical Project from 2011 is devoted to working out an overarching view of ethics that is in continuity with the idea that our moral practices have evolved and will continue to evolve. According to this view, the role of philosophy is to be understood as located as it were, within these very practices, as part of the general project of contributing to both our understanding of the ethical problems that we face here and now, and to our understanding and evaluation of the options that we have when it comes to solving these problems. Philosophy, hence, 
is to play, according to Kitcher, an important part in this general project. And so are the sciences, and so are literature and music. Indeed, thinking about literature and music is not just an upper sue to what Kitcher is, as it were, officially engaged with, but something, something to which he has also devoted much of his time and his enormous intellectual energy, resulting into Alia in the books Finding an Ending, Reflections on Wagner's Ring, 2004, Joyce's Kaleidoscope, An Invitation to Finnegan's Wake, 2007, Deaths in Venice, The Cases of Gustav von Achenbach, 2013. Hereby, I hope to have given you some indication of the depth and breadth of Kitcher's work. And if you allow me to go a little off script, already as a list of papers, this would be an impressively rich and diverse oeuvre. But the titles I've been mentioning all are titles of books, and I've not even mentioned all of the books that he has published. Kitchell is not only a widely read and highly original thinker with an enormously broad intellectual horizon, but also a very productive philosopher. And there is more to come. Philip, I'm looking very much forward to your lecture on the possibility of social progress. Well, thank you, Thomas, for that really very generous, lovely introduction. It's a huge privilege to give the Daimler Lecture here at the American Academy in Berlin, and I want to thank you all for coming. What I'm going to talk about this evening is a fragment of the large project which is, has been gestating within me uh, for some time now, a project to renew pragmatism, to try to make the themes and ideas of the classical American pragmatists, and in particular, John Dewey, come alive philosophically in the 21st century. And I'm going to do a little bit of that today. And I hope I won't uh, stop too short and, uh, and leave you, um, leave you uh, feeling dissatisfied. But please push me in the question period, and I'll try to go further. OK, so probably no philosopher, certainly no philosopher I know, has been as dedicated and enthusiastic about the idea of social progress as John Dewey. Uh, here is, however, Dewey in another mode, reflecting on the apparent difficulties that beset any account of social progress. He sees at the top, in his little discussion of Robinson Crusoe, that talk of progress is all too often a way of patting oneself on the back, or as, or as he puts it, cheering yourself up a way of showing how far your civilization has come from the savagery or barbarism that preceded it. And towards the bottom, he gets into what I think is perhaps the deepest worry about social progress, namely that societies are thoroughly mixed. They have virtues, they have vices, and it's impossible to reduce these to any kind of common denominator. Hence, what we tend to do in practice is find things that we can measure, like gross domestic product, and substitute economic measures for genuinely social measures in thinking about our progress. So there are then three discontents that uh, anybody who wants to talk about social progress has to face up to. Is this merely a method of appeasing oneself, cheering oneself up, congratulating <coughs> oneself? Are cross-temporal comparisons just too difficult because of the, of the incommensurability of various kinds of goods? And so it becomes fatuous to say whether 21st century Berlin or New York has made progress since 5th century Athens. But Dewey himself is often criticized on the second grounds that so-called so progressives have a naive view either of the natural arc of history, the way in which history left to its own devices will tend, or of the direction in which they want to push it. And that's another kind of worry. Now, I think the notion of social progress can be disentangled from these concerns. I want this evening to try to rehabilitate an endangered concept. And to do that, I have to set back 
step back a little bit and invite you to think about the logic of progress concepts for a moment. Now, you can talk about progress with respect to lots of different things, lots of different systems, as I'll call them. You can ask whether the Catholic Church is making progress. You can ask whether the theory of the chemical bond has made progress. Or you can look at a young musician and say, ah, is he or she making progress? Sometimes in doing this, it's useful to introduce bits of mathematics. As, for example, when a patient is recovering from an operation, and you chart the patient's progress by measuring the levels of a particular compound in that patient's body. Now, on to a second set of distinctions. We can distinguish various kinds of approaches to progress. There are global conceptions of progress. Take the system, take any two states of it, you can make a comparison. You can say things are getting better, things are getting worse, things are about the same. Those are global concepts. Much less ambitious is to focus on what I'll call local concepts, which look at some pairs of temporally adjacent states. Now, you'll notice that my example of the patient was a completely global concept. By specifying the values of the substance at any given time, you could tell for any pair of states whether you'd made progress in going from the earlier to the later one. But not all progress concepts I like that. And then finally, I want to introduce the idea of a locally complete concept of progress. That's when you can compare any two pairs of, any, any, any pairs of temporally adjacent states and say, are you making progress? Are you not making progress? Now, you might think that if you had local completeness, then you would automatically have a global concept. But that's wrong. It's wrong for various reasons, and the important one this evening is that transitivity of progress can sometimes fail. One state can be better than its predecessor, another state can be better than that successor, and yet the third state may not be better than the first one. That can come about because the adaptive landscape, to use an evolutionary metaphor, or the criteria or the weights of the criteria for making progress change with the circumstances. This is an important possibility that I want to take account of. Okay, finally, my most important set of distinctions, and this is, this is one I'm really going to ask you to try to, to hold in mind. There are teleological concepts of progress. If you're going on a journey towards a particular destination, you make progress teleologically. That is, there's a goal, and progress is measured by how close you get to the goal. You might think that that's the way progress always works, but it isn't. Think about smartphones. Smartphone technology makes progress, but there is no platonic ideal of the smartphone towards which we are headed. <laughs> what smartphone improvers do is they look at particular problems that contemporary technology has, and they try to solve them and make, make things a bit better. And that doesn't go in any particular definite direction. There's no unified goal towards which things are headed. Or take the case of the musician. Imagine a young pianist. We can talk about him or her as making progress, even though there isn't some ideal of the performer, some synthesis of, shall we say, Rubinstein and Schnabel and Alfred Brendel, uh, who can interpret most brilliantly all of the works of the keyboard ranging from Gabrielli at the beginning to uh, Ligeti and Stockhausen at the end and play them, as it were, better than anybody else can. That is an absurd fantasy. With respect to musicians, as they get better, we look at the ways in which they improve in particular respects, their technique, their interpretive sensitivity, and so on. And so I'm going to suggest that there are pragmatic concepts of progress, and those proceed by solving problems in the current state. Okay, now I can put my cards on the table. I'm going to defend a concept of social progress, which will be local. It will not be locally complete and it will be pragmatic. So it strips down and is rather less ambitious than it might be. And in this way, I claim, it addresses the discontents that I voiced at the beginning. I'm not going to argue that in detail. That would 
probably not be the best way to use my time this evening. But if you want to challenge me on that later on, we can come back to it. Now, you might think that if you do that, then you've sacrificed all the interest of the concept of progress. And I think that's wrong. I think, like Dewey, that concepts are for action and they look to the future. And if you can have a concept of progress that judges local transitions, transitions from one state to its successor, and says this would be a progressive way to go, that wouldn't be a progressive way to go, that's the sort of thing you need for decision and action. The task, if you like, is to understand how to go on from where we are. And I share Dewey's hope. When Dewey looked at the history of various practices, looked back, he saw most of the progress that people had made as having been blind, contingent, unsystematic. Think about the progress that has been made with respect to um, fair treatment for those who love members of their own sex. That happened quite contingently in the United States as the result of an evening event in a bar in down, you know, downtown New York. And as we learned on Monday, it happened contingently in Berlin too, because a police officer just happened to think that the best way of applying a particular law was to set up a space in which gay men and lesbian women could meet and mingle. Now, Dewey's hope was that this blind, unsystematic, rather slow mode of progress could be made clearer, more efficient, more enduringly progressive if we had a better conception of what progress was in various areas, including in the social sphere. And so Dewey says, let's, as philosophers, get clear on these things and try to use those concepts then to advance social change. That's what Dewey is all about, and that's what Dewey and pragmatism, as I understand it, is all about. Okay, now I'm gonna warm you up gently for this by taking you first into an area in which it's pretty hard to deny that something progressive happens. I don't think many people would want to, to deny the claim, for example, that genetics has made spectacular progress since 1900. I choose 1900 because that's the year in which three people independently rediscovered Mendel's work. Now, that's not teleological. We aren't closer to the final genetic theory. There's no such thing as the final genetic theory. There's no such thing as the final theory, period. Think about this room for the period during which you listen to me. How many true statements are there in any given language about this room? The answer is some very, very large infinity. It's at least the power of the continuum and it may be much bigger than that. Most of them are completely uninteresting. Indeed, my fear as I give this lecture is that all of them may be uninteresting. Uh, but uh, certainly most of them are profoundly uninteresting. Science is inevitably selective, and geneticists focus on certain kinds of features of the genes and not on others, and they answer particular kinds of questions. So how is this selection of questions made by the sciences? Well, you might say the scientists decide what's important, and we should leave it to them. And I want to complicate that a little bit by taking a different period, namely the period between 1900, rediscovery of Mendel, and 1925. Did genetics make progress between 1900 and 1925? Well, I'll tell you some things, right? First of all, geneticists knew a lot more about the location of genes on chromosomes. They knew how to map genes. They knew a lot more stuff in 1925 than they did in 1900. So it seems progress was made. But if you think about the questions that they were posing, they were posing lots of good questions, but they were also posing lots of other questions rather more dubious questions. And the building on the bottom over there, this, is the building that is now where Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is. It was in those days the eugenics record office. And there's a bit of the 
propaganda of the, of the, of the times over here. Uh, now, those questions, questions about the inbuilt traits of people and inbuilt inferiorities across <coughs> racial groups, across, across ethnic groups, were part and parcel of the genetics of the age. So I hope that makes you think that there's a question, a legitimate question to ask about who decides the questions that science answers. And that leads me to think about socially embedding science. Science isn't just something that is practiced by a bunch of people who ask the questions and answer them. It's also something that makes its way in society as part of an institution that has implications, consequences for how people live. And so some years ago, I introduced what I thought of as a diagnostic tool, which I called well-ordered science. Well-ordered science is a state in which the questions that are posed in scientific inquiry are those which would have been chosen in a fully representative, well-informed deliberation among participants committed to meeting one another's needs, looking for a proposal and an agenda with which everybody could live, and which, when it achieves answers, delivers those to the people who need them. Those science is transparent enough and available enough and useful enough that it can satisfy the need it's intended to do. That's a diagnostic tool for scrutinizing various aspects of current science. And it shows us quite clearly what can go wrong in commercialized science, what, comes, what can go wrong in science that neglects the diseases of the poorer parts of the world in favor of, say, pursuing <coughs> regimes of, uh, of uh, diet and cosmetics for highly affluent people. So I want to suggest that we can think of science as being socially embedded and making progress not simply by answering the questions scientists like to pose, but also asking the right kinds of questions and delivering answers to them that meet people's needs. Second example, think about ethics. Ethical cultures change over time. In my lifetime, I've seen a very dramatic change in attitudes towards same-sex relationships. The other examples are very obvious too. Ethics doesn't always make progress, but it does make progress when people give up slavery, for example. They, re they officially reject slavery. It makes progress when greater opportunities are available for women. Now, we can think about those simply in terms of the sorts of things that people claim when they're asked about their ethical convictions, the pieties that they utter, if you like. But we can also think about it in terms of how it affects conduct. How do these things actually play out in the course of society and people's lives? And of course, you can make progress in the first sense and get nowhere in the second sense. That's, of course, one of the morals of the post-Civil War period in the United States, it seems to me. Although I would defer here to Robin. <laughs> and now I want to turn to an example that may surprise you. Many people think the arts don't make progress at all. And they, they, if you say to them, does music make progress? They say, well, no, of course it doesn't make progress. Nothing composed in 2015 will be anywhere near as good as the music composed in, 2000, in 1905. That was the year Debussy wrote La Mer and Schoenberg wrote his first string quartet. I'm prepared to take a bet that nothing composed this year is going to be as good as, as that. All right. Um, OK, very good. But I chose the year 1905 deliberately. Here's the young Einstein. In 1905, as most of you, I'm sure, know, Einstein published four groundbreaking papers, one on the photoelectric effect that was cited in the Nobel Prize, one on brown body, um, brown, uh, sorry, on uh, Brownian motion, um, one on mass energy conversion mm. containing the famous E equals mc squared equation, and this one over here, 
which is the formulation of the special theory of relativity in 1905. Really not bad, actually, for a year in the life of a scientist. And I'm actually prepared to take a bet that no scientist this year will do anything as good. And actually, <laughs> science probably, collectively, probably won't do anything as good as all of that this year. So why are we so convinced that science makes progress and music doesn't? Well, let's go in for a bit of social embedding. Let's look at the physics available today. Well, that built on what all the things that Einstein and his successors did, right? And we all have that as a kind of cumulative effect of Einstein and lots of people who came afterwards. That's true for music too. We have what Debussy wrote, we've got what Schoenberg wrote, we've got what, um, what people like Ligeti and Stockhausen and Boulez have written since. We have all of these riches. And we can think of this progress too as being socially embedded, just as science when socially embedded, when it delivers products that people need, things that they can make use of in their lives, so too with music when music becomes available to people. And so if, for example, somebody is mounting a campaign to take music education back into the German schools, as it might be, that's a real contribution in this sense, in this socially embedded sense, to progress in music. Okay, so what have I done? I've approached the topic of social progress obliquely by thinking about particular institutions within our society, recognizing that we can see them from the internal perspective, but also from the ways in which they impinge on the lives of people in those societies. <coughs> and it's their contributions to the lives of people that is important to socially embedded progress. And I've put it, I've now laid my cards on the table. Social progress is a matter of improving individual lives. Oh dear, that sounds terribly individualistic. Am I committed to a noxious form of methodological individualism? where I don't think about social progress at all, what I think of is the progress of atomistic, detached, isolated individuals? The answer is no. At least I hope it's no. Uh, there is, I think, no extra entity, society, which, against which benefits to individuals are traded. I would want to resist the following kind of picture. On the one hand, we have all these individuals and their lives can get better or worse. And then there's society, and there's a separate sense in which that can get better or worse. And because then we have to ask nasty questions, like, well, can we actually trade off some of the benefits to the individuals against, you know, the improvement of das Volk or something like that? And at that point, I not only get methodologically worried, I also get, I have to say, a little ethically worried. But I'm not a card-carrying methodological individualist, because I think that part of what makes for the improvement of people's lives is the improvement of the possibilities of social relations among them. That is, the social relations are already built in to the conception of the good human life. Okay, let me let Dewey speak about this. This is Unusually punchy for Dewey, and so it's uh, so relish it while it happens. <laughs> Society is individuals in their relations. Right on, John. Okay, and an individual apart from social relations is a myth or a monstrosity. The myth part is, I think, the residues of Dewey's early Hegelianism. I go for the monstrosity bit myself. I think the individual apart from social relations is a monstrosity. That's going to be my version. OK, so I want to develop this in stages. I'm going to give you um, a quick run through views of the good life and then try to take you into some conditions that I think are useful for diagnosing social progress. So let's start with the ancient versions of the good life. This is one, of course, 
Perhaps it's the central problem of philosophy as it emerges in the Greek world. How to live, how to live well. And Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics comes up, of course, with a very good, famous list of things that make people's lives go well. Aristotle's not big on hedonism. So um, he rejects the view that what you really want is to go into that uh, machine in, in the Woody Allen movie, Sleeper, the orgasmatron, and just stay there forever. That's not Aristotle's idea at all. Instead, um, he thinks activity is important, virtue is important, friendship is important, and, well, I mean, it's easy to read him this way. The thing that's most important of all is contemplation of the truth. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what the book ends with. Okay, now this is uh, uh, a secular version of the good life, and it's profoundly elitist. Slaves, women, non-aristocrats in the Greek state need not apply for the good life. It's just not, it's not for you. It's replaced in the Middle Ages, that vision, with a different conception, which is much more democratic. The good life is all about getting into the right sort of state so you can enjoy relations with the Almighty and the hereafter. And this conception of social progress and individual progress you get, say, for example, in Augustine's City of God. Now, I think both of these are fundamentally flawed, and the flaw comes out in the Enlightenment. That's a great Enlightenment insight. Um, I do sometimes say nice things about Kant, and he had a great insight here. Um, and the insight is autonomy. That was shared by Wilhelm von Humboldt, and it was passed on from Kant and Humboldt to John Stuart Mill. In Mill's version, the pattern of your life, what's important to you, how you live, should be something that you choose. And so Mill writes in On Liberty that the basic form of freedom is the capacity to choose and pursue one's own good in one's own way. And this is a following sentence from On Liberty. Now Mill has this tendency to conjure up a particular vision. So how does the ideal life go? Well, you have a child. That child is educated and acquainted with lots of different kinds of possibilities for life, lots of different opportunities for finding out what appeals, what doesn't appeal, what the child is good at, what the child isn't good at, and so forth. And then somewhere in late adolescence or early adulthood, there's an epiphany, a moment at which everything gets determined. That's the life plan, the life project, the life theme, and then that's pursued through the rest of life. Now, I think this is, this is actually not Mill's intention, and it's a faulty picture. Rather, our lives and the patterns of our lives are constantly being made and remade. There may come a stage in our lives, and I may have reached that stage, uh, of which it's no longer substantially modifiable. But for a very long period of one's life, one refines and modifies and sometimes changes what counts as one's identity, one's central projects and desires, and what's important. And I would also want to resist the idea that this necessarily has to be something very large and very grand, sort of in the manner of James Joyce, uh, James Joyce's Stephen Dedalus at the end of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, where you know, he goes off to forge in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his, of his race. It doesn't have to be like that at all. It can be something much, much more mundane, much simpler, involving direct relations with other people, the building and sustaining of a community, etc., and so forth. So that's the, that's the conception I want to tease out of this Enlightenment uh, version of the good life. But I think that's incomplete, and it's incomplete for the reason that I gave before when I started talking about methodological individualism. It seems to me that Mill and Kant do not place enough constraints on the worthwhile life or the good life. They allow for the possibility that one could choose freely something that had absolutely no relation to the lives of others. A detached life lived out in solitude, pursuing some project that could have no interest for anybody else, even if they knew about it. That seems to me wrong. 
a life plan for a life that goes well, I think, must meet what I'll call the community constraint. That is, it must have things within it that are intended to make positive difference to the lives of others. And that can be done, and it's mostly done, by direct contact with others, nurturing families, taking care of friends, building an institution in a local, in a, a particular place for a particular local group of people, and so on and so forth. But sometimes it's done on a grander scale and at a distance, as when people write works that they intend to be read for centuries after by people they will never know or meet. So there are these two modes. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go overboard by thinking that the second mode is the dominant one, but nor should we neglect it. It is a way of living in community with others, in my sense. And so that leads me to three conditions on human flourishing or the good human life. There's an autonomy constraint, there's a community constraint, and there's a success constraint. A good life must be chosen by the person, it must have these central projects that are other directed, and the projects must meet with some success. That demands various things on the part of society. To use Amartya Sen's very good term, people have to be given various kinds of capabilities. They have to have the capability to survive, to take care of themselves, to be educated, and to engage in rich and rewarding community relations with those around them. These are very important things. And, that, and these constraints are multi, themselves multidimensional. If you think about autonomy, what is needed to set up the capacity for the kind of autonomous um, decisions that Mill and, after him, I have in mind, um, this person, this young person, must have some sense of the range of options that are potentially open. Must also have some sense of what his or her aptitudes are. That requires a very rich kind of education. We could make it actually richer and richer and richer and richer, but then that would take resources away from other projects. Similarly with, with community, there are many, many dimensions to the notion of community. I have fastened on one here, one that seems to me particularly important, but there are others. Sharing values, sharing traditions, engaging in joint projects, reproducing the structures and institutions of the communities, achieving recognition, mutual recognition of one another in community. All these things are aspects of community, and they're things that enrich people's lives. And I want to say these requirements pull in different directions. And we see that very clearly in the contemporary world, that very strong and rich communities are often those that restrict the autonomy of their members. And by the same token, some people seem to feel that when they are given an enormous amount of autonomy, living, say, within liberal Western societies, they feel a yearning for the structures of communities from which their parents or their ancestors came, and so they try to recreate those things or even go back to them. We feel these tensions, not all of us, but some people really feel these tensions within their own lives. For my purposes, what this means, and now I'm gonna start resuming that opening phase, the logic of progress concepts, is that teleology in this area seems to me hopeless. There is no ideal of the perfect society in which all human lives go, as it were, maximally well. There are lots of ways in which societies can experiment and in which they can find ways of striking a balance between rich autonomy and rich community. There are various ways in which they can try to provide success for their members in pursuing their projects. And it seems to me 
that rather than thinking in terms of some utopian vision of the perfect society, we might instead use my three, my three conditions as diagnostic tools for recognizing the places at which our own societies fall short, the places at which autonomy is compromised or community is eroded or the capacities needed to acquire, to successfully pursue projects are not well provided for. So you can think of these conditions as diagnostic instruments for picking out problems with respect to which we can then make pragmatic progress. So here's my version of the concept of social progress. It's a pragmatic concept. All the human societies we know, and probably all that will ever exist, are going to be imperfect when judged by these conditions. I'll say, and I'll use this, I'll introduce this term deliberately as a term of art or a technical term, I'll say that some people's lives are confined. Again, thinking about Joyce, I think of the, of the short story cycle, Dubliners, as being a wonderful exploration of modes of confinement in early 20th century Dublin. And if the reviews portray Tony's uh, uh, short story collection uh, adequately, it seems to me he might be doing something very similar in that. So there are these modes of confinement that exist in our societies. And social progress is a matter of responding to those and doing something about them trying to remove the causes of confinement, as I'll put it. And that means that social progress is, in a certain sense, easy. There are so many places when we look around where people's lives are confined. We can be opportunistic. We can look for the most likely ones at which our efforts can make a difference in removing confinement. But that requires something. And now I'm going to venture into territory about which I feel very tentative. Uh, it requires an ability to come to terms with the different claims that different members of a society legitimately make because of the confinement of their lives. And I think, again following Dewey, that a rich conception of democracy must involve the idea of social learning, that is, in which each of us discovers the claims and needs of others and endeavors to respond to those. And I think democracy, to make its own progress, needs an institution in which it is possible for individual members to come to be fully aware of the ways in which other lives are potentially confined and to think together on the basis of the best information about how confinement could be removed in ways that would meet some of the mm. needs of all. That seems to me to require an institution that might have to be separate from the democratic machinery that we are so familiar with, the superficial bits of democracy, the elections and the discussions in advance of those elections. Democracy is, I think, a very deep notion and it requires something more than what we currently have. And this is a place in which it seems to me something that something more is needed. This is conjectural. I have, not, I have not worked this through, the, and I am not as confident about what I've just said as some of the other things that I said previously. Now, final points. There are dangers in using this approach to social progress as a way of fulfilling the Deweyan hope of going forward more intelligently, more self-consciously, and more systematically. My concept of social progress does not necessarily foreclose the possibility that we might continue to make opportunistic progress and then find ourselves eventually in a state at which confinement persisted and which when we looked back, 
we were inclined to say that in certain respects we had regressed from a previous state. That the choices that are made piecemeal in making progressive steps lock us in to structures and roles and institutions that then themselves come to confine. And that's why part of the kind of criticism of our societies, philosophical criticism of our societies that I envisage as um, coordinate with this notion of social progress requires an activity that one might call genealogy. Looking at the processes through which various institutions and roles have emerged, the choices that have been made and the ways in which those have come to confine the lives of people, even under what seemed at the time fully <coughs> progressive steps. Now, these are not three thinkers who are normally mentioned in the same breath as John Dewey. But I have to say, I think that there are affinities between the Deweyan conception that I've been trying to develop here and the thought of each of these. But I'm going to give Dewey the last words. So the first quote, the problem of progress is a problem of, this is more like Dewey's standard, vanilla, boring, turgid prose. <laughs> the problem of progress is a problem of discovering the needs and capabilities of collective human nature as we find it aggregated in racial and national groups on the surface of the globe and of inventing the social machinery which will set available powers operating to the satisfaction of those needs. That's basically my theme this evening. But then he says two very interesting specific things with which I want to leave you. Assured and integrated individuality is the product of definite social relationships and publicly acknowledged functions. That's, I think, a rather cloudy way of trying to get at my community constraint. And what Dewey is worried about in early 20th century America is the breakdown of community. Just as, I think, Sociologists like Robert Putnam are worried about it and rightly worried about it today. <clears throat> and Dewey's second point, an economic individualism of motives and aims underlies our present corporate mechanisms and undoes the individual. This, the paper from which this comes, or the fragment of uh, this work in progress from which this comes, has a lot more to say about the relationship between economic measures of progress and my preferred notion of social progress. The economic measures do something very easy and straightforward and clean and simple. And they're useful because they do that. And they're also useful because economic progress of a certain sort is obviously necessary to the social progress that I envisage. But they really aren't in any way the whole story. And as Dewey saw, they encourage a picture of the individual which is actually antithetical to the concept of progress that I've tried to describe and antithetical to the individual's own well-being. So I leave you with those things and with the hope that there really is possibility for social progress, but it may need a considerable reworking of the democracies we know if we're to achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. for this inspiring language talk. Following a good tradition, we're going to have 10 to 15 minutes, roughly, or half an hour, or, or more yeah, of discussion here, and then can continue yeah. talking in a voice format. So you want to start? There is a microphone, which is just coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I have a question concerning the relationship of the history of philosophy to the history of the sciences and the arts. You made a very appealing case for looking at um, the parallels between scientific progress and artistic progress, both in terms of the accumulation 
of resources, a repertoire, if you will, upon which we can draw. That doesn't seem to be your view about the history of philosophy. Um, you raise very briefly, you conjure the ghost mm -hmm. of Aristotle, you conjure the ghost of Augustine, Aquinas, Kant, Mill, um, but it doesn't seem as if they provide the same kind of resource repertoires um, that the history that Debussy and Schoenberg or Einstein and Heltz um, do. It's not allowed, I take it, in your view of moral progress to say, well, I rather like Aristotle's view of, um, let us say, we'll, we'll go back to Plato's view, I want thumos, I want a life of thumos, of high spiritedness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want, frankly, to serve the community all the time. I wish to show off before the community. I wish to be admired by the community. <laughs> um, there, there's, a, there's a whole set of ideals which come to us not only from the history of philosophy, but the history of literature, which incarnates those visions. Why is there this asymmetry, or have I missed something? Um, well, I didn't intend to be entirely dismissive of, of either Aristotle or Augustine, or for that matter, of Plato. Um, I do see these, actually, these um, uh, philosophical traditions as very like the literary and artistic resources. So there's a kind of repertoire, a repertoire of perspectives, great tools for thinking. Uh, I think like tools, tools for, being, for, for being as well, possibly, but each age, and this is where I'm you know, again channeling Dewey a bit, each age has to take charge of these for itself. It's not as though these are, as it were, prepackaged solutions. They grew out of a particular social context to which they were often, um, you know, by which they were often highly motivated and to which they were often very responsive. The greatest among them, and all of the people whom we've mentioned, right, um, Aristotle, Plato, Augustine, Kant, um, all, Mill, all of these are great thinkers, and all of them have things to say to us, things that, of which we can make use, but we will put them together, I would, I would argue, in very different ways and in very different combinations in response to the, the patterns and opportunities of our own times. Now, you know, because we've had this argument before, that I'm not going to be with you on the Thumas uh, approach. I mean, I think, that's a, I think it's a very good thing that we've replaced uh, Odysseus with Leopold Bloom. Um, I, keep on doing, I keep on doing my Joycean thing. Um, Mr. Bloom is a far, is a far better model for um, us today, I think, than uh, wily, crafty old Odysseus. Um, but that... That's a, ju a judgment made reflecting on, it's not that the literature that portrays Odysseus is worthless to us, it's challenging, it's interesting, it's worth thinking about, it's worth absorbing in our perspective. And so it's not, it's not useless or, or completely passe or irrelevant, but it's not the gospel either. So I want to, you know, I, in a sense I want to say, um, that there may be moments in the history of the arts where certain painters or certain kinds of composers appeal and are relevant to the attitudes of people at a particular period and other, other points where they're not. And, and I'd say the same about, about philosophy too. There are two follow-ups to this. Yes. Um, since I usually think I'm the only person who's arguing for the possibility of progress, I feel a bit strange in uh, raising objections because <laughs> I'm basically completely happy uh, that you're doing this. So take these as devil's advocate questions. One of them is connected with Rainey's question, namely, um, so I, I wrote down um, your saying at a couple of points, you thought one could argue for the possibility of progress without positing anything like te teleology, without positing anything like an ultimate ideal. And yet, I think you're actually positing something extremely strong in arguing for uh, central projects intended to foster the well-being of others. Mm -hmm. um, 
if I were really trying to tease you, I would say, you know, I heard something like that from Pope Francis a couple of weeks ago, you know? Um, <laughs> now, I happen to think there's a lot to be said for that claim, but I certainly don't think it's non-teleological um, or without uh, an ultimate ideal. And, and mm. Rainey just, you know, posited another one that, um, you know, one could argue for. So I do think one needs argument for one rather than the other. That's the first okay. slightly more abstract question. The second one is a more pragmatic one, and I just wonder, you talked a lot about um, progress in our lifetimes vis-a-vis um, -vis acceptance or even celebration of same-sex loves. And at the same time, we've all seen at, in exactly the same time period where we saw astonishing progress on that direction. I mean, let's not forget 2004, John Kerry lost the election because it was suggested he was in favor of same-sex marriage. And that was a more serious uh, you know, issue than torture. I mean, so we're talking about a major transformation within about a decade. At the same time, every time you try to point this out to uh, a skeptical young person in particular, they will point out to the enormous amount of social regress in economic mm -hmm. terms. And I wonder if there's any kind of you know, if you have a story to tell, I mean, one might just say, okay, we make progress on some fronts and, and uh, you know, we go backwards on other fronts and that's what human freedom is about. It's progress isn't necessary, it's possible and it's in our hands. But I wonder if you have another story to tell that might be able to, um, to balance when things like that happen as they just have in the last decade. Okay. Um, both questions are very good. Um, I don't think you want to confuse um, two different notions. One is the notion of values and ideals on the one hand. The other is of, of final goals on the other. Uh, it seems to me that you can talk about um, community, autonomy, and so forth as values and ideals. They admit of all sorts of degrees. They admit of all sorts of elaboration in different ways. Um, they can be used in terms uh, to diagnose problems with our current state. They cannot be seen, I think, there's no version of them that can be seen as a final aim towards which we are headed and against which we should measure our progress. Um, I mean, the example of the, of the pianist and the smartphone was intended to, uh, to set you up for this. I mean, there's no doubt that one of the things you want a pianist to be able to do is to play runs fluently, to be, have to have lovely and even trills and so forth. You want the pianist to be able to be very sensitive to rubato playing in Chopin. Um, you want the pianist to, to have a sense of the weight of late Beethoven sonatas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, I mean, all of these are ideals that can be used to um, help al along a young musician. You could say, well, you need to pay more attention. But there isn't this final, as it were, composite ideal where everything gets put together. There are bits and pieces. That's what I want to say. And that's why, I, that's why there isn't teleology here. Uh, I've, often, I've often, I think, written badly on this in the sense that I haven't been very clear about what the function of things like the ideal of well-ordered science or the ideal of autonomy or the ideal of community are. They are simply diagnostic tools. I'm, I'm really inverting things. So instead of thinking about progress to, we to think of progress from. And to identify the places where progress is needed from, you use bits and pieces of things which if you could weld them all together in some, you might, might count as a final goal. But they're not weldable together. That's the point. And so what you have to do is use them piecemeal as these local diagnostic instruments. And that's why the space is open and importantly open for people to do genealogical work because these things, when pursued piecemeal, can get in one another's way. 
right? So that's the disadvantage of, of this sort of uh, pragmat pragmatic approach. Um, okay, now, um, the second question. Can you, do you mind repeating it? Because I... Uh, what, do you do about, what do you do about situations in which you see obvious progress on one front oh, right, and obvious right, yeah, regress yeah, 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 on yeah. others? Okay, so, so that, was, that was really something that I was trying to take account of in thinking about the various opportunities for progress. There are so many opportunities for progress. And yet, by taking advantage of some of them, we may neglect others. We need some dev device in our democracies that keeps the claims and needs of all clearly in view. That was the point about that, that rather conjectural, speculative stuff about a mechanism for somehow synthesizing the, the ways in which lots and lots of the lives of lots and lots of different kinds of people are confined and thinking about that as it were collectively so that when the when these opportunistic things go forward we don't lose sight of the fact that while we're concentrating as it might be on the social aspects of confinement we neglect the economic and conversely so that's the place which that, the sorts of things which the young people are complaining about is, as it were, supposed to be um, reckoned with. I think, um, look, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing social history here and it would be silly for me to try to put forward uh, some sort of account of why it was when people are becoming so sensitive on certain kinds of social confinement issues, they don't at the same time get sensitive on the economic confinement issues, or in fact, they get less sensitive on those. But we certainly need a mechanism for keeping all of these modes of confinement in front of us and, and estimating their severity on various kinds of people. So I mean, there was, an, there was an attempt, as it were, to respond to that kind of phenomenon, but not really to tell a historical story about it within the lecture. No, I've got another seven, <laughs> number of treaties, now nine people on the list. I very much appreciated your talk, uh, very much. Um, I thought it was very clear and very in a funny way, it's both sober and moving. <laughs> um, but it seems to me that what you were giving us was a set of ethical standards for a democratic society. And once I move you in that direction, I think I have to pick up really on what Susan was saying. Doesn't it require that you move more in the direction of some sort of social theory. Because this is the, in a sense, you're giving the, the moral criteria for a certain kind of society that would have been completely alien to half the people you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and not because they were in any way defective, but it's com it, it completely alien to them. Um, the fact that it's not alien to you or I would say to people in the audience says something about the historical and social framework within which we live. And wouldn't one have to then try to also grapple with what is it about the framework that, to use Susan's example, things can simultaneously go worse and mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Are they related, or is that completely contingent? Uh, one could make a similar argument with you know, the golden age after 1945 for 25 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. that lifted the living standards of large portions of the population of Western industrialized societies at the cost of certain very strong exclusions. Uh, both were operative, and it's very difficult to take one over the other. It seems to me we have to try to understand them in order to really understand the mechanisms of what is confining, to use your term, um, and then also to understand why you get movements where people want more confinement. 
um, that your set of criteria... I don't think they want more confinement. I think they want different confinement, actually. <laughs> uh, but go on. No, okay, I'll accept that. Um, but basically, what I'm trying to do is push you, as long as you're speaking with Dewey, uh, to push you more in the direction of a social ethic rather than an attempt at a, a decontextualized ethic that actually, for me, is very contextual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so look, I mean, I think that there's a lot in what you're saying. I think I would be quite happy um, if I were convinced that there was a really good social theory waiting for me just to grab off the shelf. Um, I, would be, I would be very, very happy to in, try to integrate it with what, I've, what, I, what I said this evening. What really disturbs me in your question most is I think the completely correct point that there are lots of people who would find the framework profoundly alienating. And I think the right answer to that is actually to, to, to go one more uh, move in the democratic direction I want to go in, which is to, as it were, include them in the conversation. It's not the theory want, I want. Uh, I want the data. Uh, possibly this is because I'm a brutish empiricist. Um, and, uh, and what I really want from them is an understanding of what it is that they're finding alienating so that I can build a more inclusive framework that responds to their concerns. Um, that, I think, is actually more important for me than, um, than trying to uh, articulate what I've got in terms of, uh, of a theory, unless I'm convinced that there's one ready to hand. And I would say one other thing, that this is, in a certain sense, this is the point of that very brief excursion into the three genealogists, right? This is the point at which they, they come into play because faced with these forms of alienation and these senses of certain kinds of confinement which we regard as, or which many of us regard as relatively trivial, suddenly being seen as so confining that they will drive young London women to go off and, uh, and join um, uh, ISIS. Um, that sort of that sort of phenomenon, I think, has to be understood, and I think I think we have to begin to see what what is being lost in um, in what look like um, relatively mundane and, and I guess vaguely tolerable forms of confinement. But thanks, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a good challenge. Great. Thank, thank you. Hello, are you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, my question is about the uh, intransitivity of uh, social progress. Yeah. Um, the fact that you can have many instances of social progress, local social progress, but then you, all these instances can be, uh, result in a, in a state which is worse than the yep. initial state. Yep. And uh, my question is about the solution of this problem, because uh, I'm thinking, for, for example, in the case of environment, which, uh, OK, you can have many wonderful uh, progresses in, in different areas, but on the whole, uh, you can have catastrophic uh, results. And then you mentioned, as a solution of this, this uh, gene genealogy, uh, but I, I would like to, to hear a little bit more about how you solve this, this kind of global uh, problems or global uh, regression as a result of many local mm -hmm. progresses. Okay, so look, that's, that's very good because in a certain sense, what you're saying is that there's um, a, an easy example of the failure of transitivity, which we see in the environmental crises that are confronting us. And that is surely not going to be solved by any amount of, of, of genealogical reconstruction. Complete, that's completely correct, it seems to me. So my, my motivating example here 
simply because I've thought about this in the context of evolutionary adaptation, is uh, populations moving on a uh, selective landscape that changes as the populations move. And those, these sorts of understandings are, um, are very good for getting the theoretical po po possibility of intransitivity um, forward. But actually, I'm also motivated by a reading of Foucault. And in a sense, this is, these, are, these are themes that are also there in Dewey. Um, so Foucault can be read as seeing that there are certain kinds of steps that are taken at various points in order to solve particular social problems. And they are partial solutions to those social problems. And then as you pursue them, they institutionalize and develop a set of roles and social relations that become profoundly confining. Now that sort of thing, I think, can be addressed by means of, um, of the kind of genealogy that Foucault um, was interested in. Uh, I once had a, a, this was towards the end of his life, I was my, very much younger, uh, I once had a three hour conversation with Foucault and, and in it, Foucault is notorious for telling people what they sort of want to hear. So <laughs> I, I suspect I, he, I, I got the version of his views that he wanted somebody like me to have. Um, anyway, um, out of that came the thought that what he was doing was in the interest of a kind of liberation. That it was, he was going back to the moments, the choice points in the history of various institutions at which various important possibilities had been closed off. And he thought that by doing that, and this goes back to Rainey's first question about the relevance of, uh, of old bits of philosophy and old philosophical perspectives, we might come to see alternatives for ourselves that would actually help us escape confinement. So you're absolutely right in the environmental case, but I do think there are cases that, um, that actually demand this kind of uh, genealogical treatment. But what I've said in Foucault's name may not be at all what Foucault believed or thought was most central to his work, but it's what came out of this conversation and has influenced my reading of the works ever since. Hello. Um, I have a little bit of a practical question maybe because um, I'm interested in the sociology of valuation and evaluation. <coughs> Excuse my voice. And um, so the word assessing um, catched my view and because you said that progressive societies need democratic me mechanisms for assessing the urgency of this mm -hmm. problem. And then you were talking about the need of an institution which might need to be separate of, of the democratic That's machinery. Right. And so I was thinking even though institutions might be like values or institutions like the re like religion or family, I was thinking if you could um, maybe say s something more about this institution, how you envision it, and in the sense of like, is there like a, do you imagine like an intermediary organization or like, um, like, um, like an internal governance unit or something, which is maybe a nonprofit or how is it related to the government? You know, like a okay. like inter, inter, internal governance unit, quote, quoting like Flickstein from Berkeley. All right, so yeah. I can I can um, I can say with some confidence what I think about the ways in which you try to assess the urgency of various problems, because I have a general approach to ethical method, which probably nobody in the world except me believes. Um, but let me just put it out, right? So that the best way of ethical, making ethical decisions is um, on any given issue is to bring into deliberation the affected parties with representatives of each particular point of view and perspective, <laughs> inform them with the best available information, and have these, par these participants debate under a condition that I call mutual engagement, where none of them will be satisfied with an outcome which leaves any of the others profoundly dissatisfied. Okay, so that's the, the thought is not that, not that you aim for something which is, as it were, optimal from everybody's point of view, but that you aim for something with which everybody can live. That's part of the, of the way I articulate the notion of well-ordered science, but it's also a more general um, 
approach to ethical method that I developed in my book on the ethical project. Um, okay, now, if you think about that with respect to confinement within a society, um, imagine that there were something that had the status of, um, I'm going to use an American example, the Congressional Budget Office that, went, that was sort of a bit outside the political process and that had the responsibility of formulating, of setting up the conditions for the best approximation we can get to this kind of discussion of human needs within the society. And that it was, it, there was a public, as it were, expectation that politicians running for office would have to take account of this. They would have to respond to it. They would have to explain where they stood with respect to it and on what they were going to do to implement the various recommendations that came out of this. That's what I have in mind. So democracy as social learning is, as it were, combined with democracy as voting and, uh, um, uh, and election of representatives and so forth. I am not sure of, 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 of what I've just said. Uh, I am not sure that this is, that, I mean, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm much, I'm much moved by Dewey's thought that the superficial manifestations of democracy are not the real thing. That you don't have democracy when you get people going to the polls and coming out and waving purple ink stained fingers in the air. That is not enough. They've got to be informed. They've got to know what they've got to doing. They've got to have re real choices, et cetera, et cetera. And part of that, it seems to me, involves this kind of social learning that creates a democratic society, a genuinely democratic society. So this part of the project is an attempt really to deepen the notion of democracy in the ways that Dewey wanted to do. And what I just said to you in a way of, in a way of institutionally framing it is a conjecture about how that might be done. The president asked me to see to it that uh, this part of the discussion does not go on very much longer than nine o'clock, which is, I'm afraid, we've only time for one more question in this round, and I apologize that we didn't ask them, but still on the list, but there is more time to continue later on. Okay. Thank you for this uh, rather uh, conceptual talk. Um, I have lots of small and bigger problems I would, uh, I would like to ask, so I pick, but I pick two for... for okay. uh, one thing is about... Um, I was a little disturbed by the fact that you mentioned the, uh, uh, the ideal of uh, life, of the medieval... Um, uh, the medieval uh, Catholic Church as democratic. That gives me little shivers, as as maybe every time the the Catholic Church is mentioned in the in the in the context of progress, anyway. Yeah. But um, uh, um, uh, the second. Uh, I understand the, the shivers. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, and but the the I would I would like to know how you how this this uh, reduction. Uh, how, how you come to this? Uh, you came to this reduction. I think it's a very reductionist claim. Um, and the second part is, uh, I, I think it's the thir your third, uh, your third um, sheet, which was about uh, the the discontents. Uh, and I had what I had awaited there was uh, a a remark or reminder of the fact that uh, there are, um, and I ask this because this is one of the, of the things that gives, you, gives us most problems in our, our, our cult cultural uh, system right now, that is the, uh, um, the, the cross-cultural diversification. That is to say, um, that for for some cultures, uh, this kind of uh, this concept of progress is not even f and, and not only not feasible but even not thinkable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it uh, am I to 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 believe that your concept of social progress and the the ethical uh, un undertaking that is behind it? Uh, 
in a way uh, only works out in democracies and uh, uh, of, of, of our kind. And uh, uh, what would you say to, if I said, well, that's another rather reductionist view of what philosophy could and should aim at? Okay, so um, the first question I think is relatively straightforward to answer, and the second question is very big. Um, so the, the Catholic Church, Church's conception, or Augustine's conception better, of the, of the good life is democratic as opposed to Aristotle's in the obvious sense that it regards all people as potentially able to live a worthwhile life. Christ has, Christ has made salvation available to all of us. I would have thought that was, uh, that was something Augustine would have been pretty, pretty um, firm about. Um, so it's potentially right there for all of us. So that's, that's the only sense in which I meant it was democratic. That, um, as opposed to Aristotle, who right, who's for, for whom slaves and the lowborn and the women are all out, right? Um, now, the second one, I mean, you're, this, is, this is like Moishe's question. I mean, you've got, certainly you're absolutely right in thinking that the framework that I constructed is going to be um, alien to the thinking of many groups. And as I already conceded in response to Moish, that means I think that we have to think very seriously about ways in which to absorb the reasons, the perspectives that the people find alienating. That may not mean that in the end that we change in ways that accommodate them, but at least it, it seems to me very important to listen to that. But now I think the really deep part of your question is not actually about whether this works in democracies, but whether it works in societies that don't, um, that don't as it were, dissociate their democracy from the religious currents within them. Uh, in other words, it's just for secular. Um, secular democracies. Um, this is, seems to me a very long story, and I can only I can only um, uh, tell a bit of it, or tell the tiniest fragment of it here, really. Um, so I want to distinguish between two kinds of religions. There are religions which are which whatever their doctrines see part of their enterprise as being the betterment of human lives in the here and now, as whatever they think about the hereafter, okay? And also do not feel that they have to be um, hostile towards other religions, that, uh, that their claims do not have to be um, uh, imposed by any kind of uh, force or coercion whatsoever. Call these, um, I don't know what you want to call them, moderately enlightened religions. Now, it seems to me that moderately enlightened religions can be brought on board. Um, you don't need to have to go all the way to what I call refined religions, which basically say, throw away the metaphysics and the doctrine or teach it as one, treat it as wonderful metaphor or allegory or poetry or something like that. Um, I mean, those are the really good kinds of religions and they, they often do a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in terms of fostering community. But, you know, we can actually manage with something a bit less than that as long as these two conditions, I think, are met. Um, the, the idea that there is, that the religion has at its heart a certain kind of humanism and also that it has at its heart a principle of at least getting along, tolerating um, alternative versions of the metaphysics. Um, so that's what, I mean, this is, this is a very hard question and, and how you make this work practically to go back to the, uh, one of the previous questions seems to me very, very hard indeed. But from a, a theoretical point of view, uh, I think one can talk about, actually one can talk about the progress, religious progress within um, societies and religious progress as a mode of social progress mm -hmm. as religions start absorbing more of these, as it were, desirable features and shedding some of the uh, less desirable ones. Let's thank the teacher for Well, thank you.